Hi guys, welcome to uh, Dovetail's virtual brewery tour. I'm Hagen. I'm Bill. Uh, we are the two brewer owners of Dovetail Brewery, and uh, we're happy uh, we're happy to be able to do this this tour for you, this special tour. Um, in it's uh, it was supposed to be our May Fest anniversary uh, today. You may or may not know what that is. It's uh, it's our annual May Fest. Grow with beguile. Uh, uh, just our, our neighbors down the down the street, and um, uh, uh, it's also our anniversary. Uh, to, this year happens to be our fourth anniversary, uh, and COVID nineteen was nice enough to show up to, to celebrate with us. Um, so uh, I think we're going to start with our first beer right now. Let's start this off right. We're, we're doing our, the, the lager, dovetail lager. And make artful pouring. Everybody, cheers! Oh, yeah, all right. So, a little more about May Fest anniversary. You know, every year we do it, we have um, uh, we have uh, a, a, um, a partner, um, a, a non profit partner for the last couple of years. Our non profit partner has been, um, it has been. A friendship center, uh, and they work on uh, relieving relieving hunger in Chicago. Um, uh, last year, uh, we uh, we were able to raise uh, twenty five thousand uh, dollars for them uh, during uh, during May Fest anniversary. And uh, Ross Alton, who runs the runs the friendship center, came to us and and uh, told us that his um, uh, that. that their services went. Uh, the use of their services went up by three hundred percent. So we wanted to be able to do something, uh, do something for them. Um, so earlier in the month, we did this stupid haircut thing, uh, which Bill still Bill still sporting his his mullet. Um, I had to get rid of my my brewer, my my, uh, my monk's bowl because uh, it was just too horrible. But I did work for a few days. Um, but this tour. Is um, uh, the, uh, proceeds from it, the proceeds from the um, from the, the sales of the tour four packs are, are going to the Friendship Center. Um, if you uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, uh, to, to 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 donate uh, to them, uh, we encourage you to do so. Uh, the link to their uh, to their donation page is in the YouTube description uh, below. Um, they're, they're a great group, uh, and they they really need uh, they really need the help uh, at at this time. So so thank you to everyone who's uh, who's who's uh, donated and who, who will donate. Cheers cheers to you guys. All right, a little bit about Duck Tail. Um, as I said, we're four years old. Uh, we um, uh, Bill and I. Uh, we met in uh, in beer school in Munich. Uh, it is really like a, if there is such a place as beer school. It's real. It's the most wonderful school uh, ever. Um, we uh, um, uh, our our school was uh, the Siebel Institute here in Chicago. Uh, they they have a partnership with a, uh, a school called the Dunes Academy in Munich. And Bill and I actually met uh, in Munich. Um, and uh, we quickly discovered through uh, hands-on research of this style that um, uh, that we enjoyed the same kinds of uh, kinds of beer, the same type of beer making. Um, and uh, after after about a year, uh, we, we decided that uh, we wanted to uh, uh, join forces. Here in Chicago, we both happen to be from 
Chicago, uh, but we, but we met over there, so we decided to join forces here and uh, create a group together. Uh, and that's kind of where the name comes from. So dovetail uh, refers to the dovetail joint of, of woodworking, uh, strongest joint in uh, in uh, all of all of carpentry. Uh, the best dovetails hold without glue and nails. So we see this brewery as uh, two brewers coming together to, to form a stronger brew. Uh, okay. So we like to say that, um, uh, that when we design a beer, um, we design it for all the senses. Uh, appearance, aroma, flavor, mouthfeel, aftertaste, uh, it's, it's all wrapped up in there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, dovetail lager that we're drinking right now. Um, we're going to talk about it uh, from, the, from that perspective. So appearance, when we serve it to you, we serve it first of all in the right kind of glass. This is, uh, we, we call it the Stein, it's not stone anymore, but it's a, it's a, a it's a, we call it the Stein. Uh, we serve it to you with a, um, uh, with a, uh, a, uh, a stand of foam that sits uh, above the rim of the glass. Um, we, uh, it's got this beautiful golden color. Uh, and when you, uh, when you bring it to your nose or to your mouth, First thing you get is the aroma. So the aroma is malty, bready, kind of bread crust, a little bit, a uh, little bit of hops, a little taste. Oh, that's good. Oh my God. Softness. Um, it's the first thing you get, a nice soft mouthfeel, we feel that's important in any lager. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, look, maybe a little bit of, uh, little bit of honey, uh, honey tongue to it, uh, a, a gentle, pleasant uh, bitterness. And then there's the fade and the aftertaste. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it leaves, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's got kind of a dry finish and a nice, Pleasant, uh, lingering, bitter. Um, it's the kind of uh, aftertaste that uh, makes you want to take another sip, or um, when you've done a few beers, it makes you want to have, uh, have another beer. Uh, and then it's back to um, then it's back to visual. Uh, so uh, Bill and I work with the, the professionals. We will demonstrate this for you. So we, we, we find, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we put an emphasis on the foam and we designed this beer so that, um, so that uh, the, the, the foam will leave a nice ring of lacing at every sip. Uh, and when you're done with the beer, uh, you'll have, you'll have a, a, a beautifully laced glass. Um, you just feel that that's, uh, that's super important for, uh, uh, for the enjoyment, uh, for the, the enjoyment of the beer, um, you'll, you'll notice um, that there's a that there's a nice uh, there's a nice layer of, of durable uh, durable foam that kind of stays uh, stays in the glass as you uh, as you drink this beer. So that's dovetail water. So. Um, what I want to know is, uh, or, or what I want to tell you guys is, uh, feel free uh, to, to ask questions uh, in, at any time. Just type them, type them in the chat. Uh, Shane is is helping us out with uh, with questions here, and so and uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, JP is helping us uh, helping us run the, run this thing. She's going to be following us around. Um, so, so Shane's going to raise his hand when he's uh, when he's got a, got questions. So ask ask questions at any time. Um, but I think right now we're going to talk about beer, beer, beer making in thirty seconds. Want to do it? Or should I? Thirty seconds. Well, take a 
form of starch, in this case barley, you crush it, you add hot water, you cook it, you separate it, bam, beer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, then you add some hops, then you ferment it, and be up there. And then for a couple weeks later, yeah. yeah. So thanks for coming, everybody. We'll see you. That's Katie. Uh, but we'll, talk, we'll talk about how we, how, we, uh, how we make this beer. So, so we're standing in front of our brew house. Um, it's a four-vessel brew house. You see two of the vessels uh, behind you. Um, what we do is we, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to move this over a little bit so you guys can see, you guys can see all four. We're going to, we're going to move over a little bit too. So, so we start out, we, we start out by, uh, by milling our malts, which is our source of starch, uh, in, in this vessel here, that's called our mash time. We, we remove the oh, window. My, yeah, this one, this one. This is weird. Um, so, so, so that's our mash time, and then we move thirty percent of uh, of the mash over uh, to this vessel. That is our kettle, and our kettle is what's called direct fire. So it has uh, uh, a huge firebox underneath it there. We blow a huge gas flame into it, and we boil that 30% of the mash, and then we move it back back over here and uh, uh, to the to the mash tun, and that raises the temperature of the the mash in the mash tun. That mash is uh, it's, it's like an oatmeal type consistency at at, at that point, um, and then we move 30% over to the kettle again, uh, boil it, move it back. Uh, and that raises the temperature again, and uh, uh, and then we uh, uh, we let it sit for a while, and all of the starches can uh, in in the in the uh, mash convert to sugar. And then we move everything over to our louder time. So that louder time has a false bottom on it. Uh, we, can we walk over there to see this? Let's, let's walk over there. Stay very close to me. All right. So Apparently the sound is better when you guys are close. Okay. So, so here's our here's our louder time. Um, put this here. So you guys are looking underneath what's called a false bottom right now. I'm gonna drop the false bottom. So our entire mash. Gets 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 moved over to uh, to to the false bottom uh, on top of the false bottom, and it and it sits for a while, and and all of the, the solids congregate right here, and there's liquid way way up there, um, and uh, we we start to to drain it out and and pump it over back over to our, our direct fire kettle, and that's how we separate uh, the sweet the sweet liquor. From uh, from the grain, so you can see there's a little bit of there's a little bit of grain left uh, from I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little bit of grain left from our last brew the other the other day, um, and then it's back over back over to the kettle. And I forgot my beer. All right, so it's back over to the kettle, the, the, and in that, in the, uh, in the kettle there, we uh, we boil with uh, uh, again with direct fire, and we add hops, uh, and we boil for about for about an hour, and uh, uh, and then uh, uh, add hops for bitterness, aroma, antibacterial qualities, and then we we move it on from from there. Um, but what we haven't talked about yet is that beautiful copper vessel over there. So we call that uh, we call that our holding vessel. Um, our uh, uh, some people would call it a work receiver. Um, 
it's, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful piece of equipment. Um, and uh, we use it all the time. We use it for, for a, few different, a few different things. One of the main things we use it for these days is to, um, uh, is, is to make our brew days more efficient. So um, the, the process that I just described for making this lager um, it's called a it's called a, a decoction mash. Right? It's actually that's a double decoction. Mash. We we pull the mash over twice, boil it, and, and send it back. And we go through all these temperature steps. And the reason that we do that is when we're when we're boiling the mash with direct fire, we're getting these uh, these caramelization reactions that kind of increase the, the depth of flavor that you get. Uh, it gives it gives it this this, this little light touch of, uh, of, of, of caramel in, in the background. Um, uh, and the, and the, different, the different temperature steps also uh, contribute different things to the, uh, uh, to the beer, the, like, like the, uh, the, the mouthfeel and, and uh, the, the, the content, the, the, the makeup of the sugars, uh, and also the, the strength of the foams. And you can see that in my glass, I've, st I've still got this, uh, this layer of foam on, on top of it, it's really it's uh, it's super durable. Um, so uh, so back to the copper, we use it to make our our when I say we make our brew day more efficient. When a single a single batch uh, of lager takes us about about twelve hours uh, to make, um, but a, a double batch we can finish in fifteen to fifteen to sixteen hours. Because we have that copper, um, and uh, it, it's it's funny, you know, that, that copper is, is very special to us. Um, it is uh, it's 105 years old. Uh, we found it on a barn floor in Germany. Um, uh, it was cut in half. Um, maybe you can. You can raise it up, or we can come around here and we can see the well. Not sure if you guys can see this, but there's a where, where my hand is right now. There's a there's a well running running all the way around uh, all the way around the, the, the kettle. And this is this is where it was cut when it came out of its old home, and, and where we had it welded back together. Um, so we weren't um, we weren't like scouring random uh, random barns in Germany when, when we were in, uh, uh, in beer school. We met these guys uh, uh, in, um, uh, in in Bavaria that deal in used equipment, uh, used German brewing equipment, and uh, um, uh, the. Uh, 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 we sat down with them and, and said, "Hey, this is how this is how we want to brew beer at Dovetail, um, and any equipment that you can find that will fit into this uh, process, um, we will uh, we'll seriously consider um, uh, seriously consider buying it." So um, uh, we met. Um, well, we 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 we, we left and and uh, and and. Uh, um, about nine months later, uh, they, they sent us an email and they said, "Hey, there are these fermenters that we have. They might they might fit into your uh, into your whole thing. Uh, it, they seem too good to be true. Uh, it's a really good price and it's like perfect for what we for what we wanted to do. Um, so so we went over there. Um, go ahead. What was the Bavarian, Bavarian guy's name? The Bavarian guy's name. Oh, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. So, so I went. I went over there, um, and uh, uh, and uh, met the gentleman uh, who uh, uh, who runs the firm. It's a little family-run firm. Uh, his name is Lothar. Uh, he uh, looks like a Lothar. Whatever you know, whatever picture you have uh, of of a Lothar. Um, uh, he actually runs the firm with his son Norbert. Uh, Norbert, son of Lothar. Uh, they're both excellent, awesome guys. They know everybody in the German beer industry. Um, and uh, uh, looked at the fermenters. They were, they were 
great. They were, they were perfect. Uh, and, and Lothar says to me, well, if you guys are really into used equipment, you should, um, you should really uh, uh, come see our storage facility. So I'm like, all right, storage facility, great. So, so we get in, uh, we get in uh, Lothar's BMW, and we kind of like ride through the, the hills of the area, and we ride into the this small town where it turns out where Lothar grew up, and uh, uh, go up to you know Lothar's ancestral home and walk walk through it, and there are these two barns in the back, and we walk in the first one, and, and there's like beer hoarders in there, and and uh, there's just used equipment everywhere, everywhere. And just sitting on the floor in two pieces is this kettle. And it looked like it was about the right price. And the right, right size, size, right size, price is another, another story. Uh, it looked like it was about the right size. And, uh, uh, and, and Lothar, uh, I, I'm like, hey, what, what's that, Lothar? Uh, and he goes, he goes, ah, it's just the old, uh, uh, the old uh, mash tun from uh, uh, the Ryan Stefan pilot brewery. And I don't know if you know, if you don't know what Ryan Stefan is, it's the oldest brewery in the world. It was founded in 1040. Um, so uh, I was like, huh. Uh, that's interesting, Lothar. And I sent Bill. I sent Bill a text. I was like, hey, check this out. Um, and and Bill's like, hey, do uh, do uh, do they have a uh, uh, do they have a lottery grant? Uh, so if anybody who's been to our tap room and has seen the, the big copper thing behind the bar, they also had a lottery grant that we bought. Uh, it's our two our two follies in this in this place in this larger larger folly of ours. Um, so, uh, so anyway, we found, uh, we bought it. We bought the fermenters. Uh, we found these guys in in Milwaukee uh, that do a lot of work for um, uh, for a uh, a small brewery up there called Miller. If you guys have ever heard of them, I don't know, uh, uh, but they have they have a gentleman on staff named Dimitri, and, and Dimitri is is one of the only people in the Midwest who can weld copper on, on that scale. He, he, he actually goes into the Miller facilities and he'll, he will fix their, their copper kettles occasionally when they, uh, when, when they need it. Um, uh, so, so Dimitri put those back together and we probably can't see it, but we've got some nice piping and, and legs underneath, uh, underneath the kettle there and the, the rest of the guys put that together for us. Uh, and like I said, we use it, we use it every day. Um, one of the one of the other things we uh, some we, we use it for is uh, when we when we make hefeweizen, we make uh, we use Chicago carbon filtered water for that for that um, uh, for that beer, and we actually will use that uh, as as the hot liquor tank uh, for the hefeweizen. But um, the reason we have to use that as a hot liquor tank is that for all of our lagers, we make our own water. So we, we, you guys, you know, everybody knows Pilsner. There's a town called Pilsen that is the home of, uh, the original home of Pilsner beer. And one of the secrets to really great, uh, like, authentic Pilsner is the soft water that they have there. Very low in minerals. And it's much lower in minerals than the, than the, the, um, the water that we get here in Chicago. We, um, we feel that that helps impart that nice softness to the uh, to the beer when you take that first sip, and also the nice um, uh, the nice dry aftertaste that gives you that that lets you ex uh, experience a, a really really pleasant bitterness. So the way we do that is we uh, with the way we make our own water is there's a it might be kind of dark, but there's a there's a machine back here that's a um, uh, it's a it's a custom reverse osmosis uh, system. We take we take Chicago water, we um, uh, we knock out all the chlorine, uh, and then we knock out all of the minerals, 
Uh, we we mix in about 10% Chicago water into into the in the mineral free water, and then we uh, we remineralize with uh, two minerals called calcium chloride and magnesium sulfate up to about as close as we can get to um, to the uh, water of uh, of Pilsen. So usually, if you guys were here. What we would do at this point is we would do a water tasting. We would taste Chicago water uh, straight from the tap. We would taste carbon filtered water, um, Chicago carbon filtered water. And then we would taste the water that we make, uh, it's frozen water. So hopefully when all this nonsense is over, uh, we'll be able to have brewery tours again. And, um, if you guys want to do that, do that tasting. Uh, Come on, come on in. We'd love to. We'd love to see you guys. We miss. We miss doing our tours in person, and we, we miss having everybody in the tap room, of course. Um, so, I think we're going to go on to our next station, um, and maybe, maybe we'll get Bill to tell the malt story. <laughs> our next station is upstairs, but the the. the uh, uh, we, we if, if the malt that we use, like the malt that we use in this beer, the lager, is um, uh, is eighty percent Pilsner malt, uh, um, twenty percent Vienna malt. So Pilsner malt um, is uh, <laughs> nice shot of my my white caps. Um, Pilsner. Pils Pilsner malt is uh, one of the palest malts uh, that, that's that's produced. Uh, Vienna malt is kind of a reddish, a little bit of reddish malt, uh, a little more, a little more toasted. Um, and uh, we we get our malt from uh, we get our malt from uh, a, a company in. Uh, in uh, a town called Bamberg in Germany. And Bamberg is like beer Disneyland. Uh, it's 90,000 people, like nine or 10 breweries. Uh, most of them, most of those breweries are world class. Um, most of those breweries are world class. And uh, yeah, and we, we get, uh, get a nice amount, get most of our malt from, from that. Uh, from that monster, but it's, it's kind of a funny story about how we found that monster. So, part of uh, beer school is this uh, study tour uh, that they send you on, they send you all around uh, Europe looking at different equipment suppliers and breweries and uh, anything to do with beer. And uh, one day, our stop was in Bomberg, so Disneyland of beer. And uh, there's uh, one sort of a company called Wireman. They make malt uh, worldwide and ship it all over, but you know, a little bit German malt. And a really nice tour. Uh, had for the first time in my life, um, what's it called? The raw pork, pork tartare? Oh, yeah. Hockey painter. Hockey painter, yeah. Um, which sounds gross, but it's really good. Um, anyway, uh, after this um, uh, tour of this plant, they sent us out and said, go enjoy this town. Lots of breweries here, go try them all. Or, so we, we go and try them all. And uh, we're, uh, we're at one called uh, Kiesmann, which is a really great brew. It's across the street from Mars, if you guys ever go there. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're a bunch of uh, Americans drinking, probably being loud. And uh, this gentleman comes over and sits down and we start talking. And, uh, turns out he's the brewmaster of the, of the brewery. So um, I brought up the subject of malt, since we were just at this uh, malt house. Um, and I, I made a assumption that he must have used uh, wireman malt. Uh, and at that moment, he slams his beer down on the table and says, Nine! <laughs> wireman is shit. 
And I was just, I was flabbergasted. You know, I, I thought this was the greatest stuff on the, on the planet. And it is. I mean, it's really, it's a wonderful mom. It is good. We use it. We do use it. Limited quantities. So I took myself, put myself back together and cautiously asked him, well, if you don't use wiremen, what do you use? And he mentioned uh, Baumberger Molsteri, which I never heard of. Um, and so he talked about why it was so great and why he thought wiremen was so shitty. Um, and I just kind of took that little nugget and threw it up in my brain and quickly changed subjects to hops, I think. <laughs> uh, or maybe a hornet around a beer for them. Um, and then uh, when we were in, uh, when we were going to Europe to, to get all this equipment Hagen talked about earlier, uh, we were in Bomberg and this little bit of information popped out of my head and I said, hey, told Hagen's story and we called him up and we went and had a tour. And uh, yeah, we're customers ever since. So we get our malt uh, directly from the supplier. Uh, we have to order it uh, about two or, two or three months in advance because uh, that's how long it was. When we order it, they make it. Um, and then they ship it over. We have to order uh, it by the container. So uh, we have to order a lot of it and uh, to plan accordingly. Uh, 20, 20 tons at a time. Yeah, and uh, right now we're doing about uh, four four containers a year. You want to finish that one? Yeah. So we're moving on to Rausch beer. So get your Rausch beer. Speaking of bumper, one. So let, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about Rausch beer. Trying to get the so guys. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about rock beer before we talk about this thing that we're that we're leaning on first. Uh, so you know, we thought we've just been talking about um, uh, talking about Bomberg and uh, Rausch beer is a very uh, it's a very uh, special special beer. Rausch um, in German uh, means smoke, and uh, beer in German means beer. Uh, so uh, it's a, this is a smoked beer, and, and one of the special things about uh, Bomber uh, is that um, uh, it is uh, it is the, the current home of German smoked beer. Um, it is uh, so, so smoked beer um, these days is very rare, and, and when I say smoked, I mean the malt. Is 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 uh, there is actual wood smoke in the case of this beer, beech wood smoke passed through the malt during the during the drying process. Um, and if you guys you guys get the aroma off your off your beer, you'll smell that it's like a, it's like a nice Westphalian ham or, or a bacon. Um, so and so in uh, in. in in most parts of the world, um, Rausch beer was abandoned uh, uh, because because uh, uh, drying malt over smoke was abandoned. But uh, the, the, the people of Bomberg are kind of kind of stubborn Germans. Uh, we looks like we got a we got a question. Somebody's asking if we talk about Grunchiski or we'll talk about smoke. Oh yeah, we'll talk about Grunchiski too. So we so right now we actually have. We have what four four smoke beers that you can get from uh, from Dovetail. It's a Rauch beer, the uh, Rauch Doppelbock, uh, the Grochiskia, and the uh, and our XO One. Uh, more about more, more about those in a, in a minute. Um, so so let's finish talking about our Rauch beer. So so it's a lager. Uh, it, uh, it's 5.6% uh, ABV. The lager, the, the house house lager that we just drank, the Dovetail lager, that's 4.8% uh, ABV. Um, so this is this is a little more robust. Um, it's it's definitely smoky. Uh, it's a, it's a, a kind of medium medium bodied, um, nice and nice and dark, kind of in the uh, in the Schlenkerle style. If you guys know. You know, Bob Barrett, there are two breweries uh, uh, that, that 
within bond pairs that, that make uh, only or, or make predominantly uh, smoked beer, Schlenkerla and Spezial. Spezial is, is, a, is a little more amber, uh, uh, Schlenkerla is a little, a little more dark uh, taste. Oh yeah, softness again, but you really get that, you really get that smokiness on the, uh, on the, on the taste, that nice, that nice beach wood, beach wood smoke. Um, nice uh, chocolate undertones. We, we use a, um, uh, a Belgian uh, chocolate malt, we don't add chocolate to this, we use a Belgian chocolate malt because we feel it has Nice chocolate and flavor as well as uh, as color. So you get kind of this this chocolate smokehouse kind of thing going, and also a, 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 then a nice dry finish again. Uh, it's this thing is uh, it's uh, 35 IBUs. IBUs is a way to measure bitterness. Uh, it's more bitter than the uh, than the lager, uh, but the bitterness. Uh, uh, um, the bitterness and the body um, uh, kind of kind of are in balance with the smokiness because uh, what you don't want from a raw beer is you don't want it to taste like you're looking at an ashtray or campfire ashes. You want it you, you want it to be a, more akin to um, eating. Nice, nice piece of ham, you know, nice piece of smoke. Um, yeah, so. so the uh, earlier question was the uh, Brojitski. Uh, that is a Polish beer, an old Polish beer. It uh, has a long history. It's a beer that's about 900 years old. Um, uh, started in the town of Brojitski. Uh, which is in you know, the eastern, western, western, western uh, world. And uh, what's, what's special about this beer is that it's a 100% uh, oak smoked wheat beer. So no barley, 100% uh, wheat, but they're, it's all oak smoked, so the oak gives it all lighter, um, a lighter smoke flavor. Uh, that beer is uh, very bright and citrusy, um, a little higher. Uh, popping to balance out that smokiness, uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great beer that's uh, been kept alive by Wireman. Wireman is their malt, uh, they're the ones that make the smoke smoked wheat malt. Uh, so we're thankful uh, for Wireman. I don't think he's mine, whatever make it grow jet skis. <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to make a uh, smoked wheat malt. Yeah, I, uh, Wire, I, I think Wireman, uh, Wireman and, and one of our professors from beer school, like they, they really resurrected the style. I'm really glad, you know, really glad that they did. Um, so the, and the, uh, is there another question? How does the smoke get in the beer? How does the smoke get in the beer? Um, well, we just buy like the smoke and dump it into the kettle. No, 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 no. We so the so the malt itself. Now, if you were on the real the real brewery tour, like before we came upstairs, we would have stopped. And we would have tasted like different malts, and then and then we'd probably be drinking the, the Rauch beer, and then and then we would go get some smoked malt, and you would actually taste the malt. So the malt itself is smoky. So 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 malting is the process. Of taking barley seed or any any kind of any kind of seed, steeping it, letting it grow for two to three days, and then arresting the uh, the, the the growth uh, of that seed with heat. Um, and, and the way it's arrested is it's it's spread out onto a, uh, onto a, a, a floor, and it is uh, it, and it is it is dry. Uh, from from below, it's one method. There's also a drum a drum method. Like, a, like a, if you guys have ever seen coffee roasters, there's a, there's a there's a drum method of doing it too. So 
So in modern waltz, uh, at modern waltzers, uh, what they do is they they pass hot air through the uh, through the malt to let uh, to, to 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 heat the malt and let and, and stop the growth. But in the old days, they used to spread it out on the floor. They would have a fire below, and the warm air plus plus wood smoke would come up through the uh, the germinated malt and, and stop the growth uh, stop the growth that way. So this the malt that we use in this beer and in the in the Brzezinski is uh, uh, is still uh, is, is still dried with actual wood uh, wood smoke and wood wood fire air and it just it just uh, seeps its way into the uh, into the seed. So the, the the malt that we use for this beer, ninety five percent of it is Wireman Beechwood smoked. Um, well, and then uh, for the Kuchiski, it's 100% 100 uh, percent oak smoked wheat. So I hope that hope that answers the question. So I think uh, let's let's move on. Uh, let's move on. So I guess briefly, uh, Rock Double Buck is our rock beer, but uh, just at a higher uh, a higher ABV. Uh, what are we at? Two seven point two percent. This year, um, and uh, XO one, uh, XO one is the brow beer. We call it a Flanders round because we took a fully fermented brow beer. You might have seen some barrels that we walked past on the way up here. We put it into barrels and we added um, added the microbes that that make uh, uh, Flanders red and Flanders brown beers, uh, Belgian style. And uh, uh, we let it sit for a year, and then we, uh, and then we packaged it. Uh, and it's uh, it's this, this it's one of the weirdest beers you'll ever taste. In uh, you know, we think in a, in a really good way. Um, all right, let's talk about this thing. Uh, so this is a cool ship, uh, and uh, there's this there's this pipe here, right? This pipe leads down to the brew house that we were, we were just standing in front of. Uh, and our last step down in the brew house is boiling with hops. Uh, and after, after we boil with hops, we, we pump all of that boiled wort. Uh, and this wort is, is the sweet liquid, the sweet, bitter liquid that, that brewers create. This, actually, I think it's, it's commonly thought that brewers make beer. Brewers don't make beer. Brewers make beer. Wort uh, and yeast makes beer. More about that later. But um, uh, we pump uh, all of the wort up here into this into this uh, this big shallow open pan, and it, it fills to uh, to about right here. If you can see my hand, um, it's about it's about halfway halfway up this pan, um, and. Uh, the it, the uh, uh, it had it performs three three or four functions for us. The first is cooling. That's what a cool ship means. Cooling vessel. Uh, the second is separation of the hops. So the hops all sink to the bottom uh, of the of the cool ship in about twenty minutes. Um, uh, the third is like you can imagine like when when if you pump boiling liquid into this thing, there's going to be steam. Uh, you guys, if, if, if we were pumping over right now, you guys probably wouldn't be able to see us because there would be a huge amount of steam like between us and uh, us and the camera. Um, and in, in fact, like in the middle of winter when it's when it's really cold outside, uh, we have the windows open when we pump over. Um, Bill and I probably wouldn't be able to see each other on the, on the coldest days. Um, we would call our uh, brewer spot. It's wonderful. It, it's wonderful when we can pump, pump over and get these, these aromas of of, of, uh, of, of words and aromatization and hops. And, uh, we've got a we've got a fan up there that's just above Bill's head. Now Bill, Bill just walked in front of it. There it is. So we've got this fan that like pulls air in from the outside and then it, it uh, and pulls it out. So we're getting a constant 
stream of, of, of cool air around the cool ship and uh, underneath the cool ship, and that's, and that's causing the, uh, uh, the work to go from boiling to scalding. Uh, the other thing that happens during that time is that that steam is pulling out uh, these volatile substances in the work that uh, uh, would create um, uh, uh, a, 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 an aroma uh, of maybe creamed corn in the final beer. And apologies to anybody who loves Rolling Rock. Um, we, we don't we don't want cream corn aroma in any of our in any of our beers. I mean, I've been involved in that in my past. Once, once or twice. Yeah. yeah. Well, go ahead, come to Mike's in the So, uh, and then the last thing that it really does is uh, it, it, we, we believe uh, that it creates this kind of mysterious cohesiveness between all of the elements of, uh, of the final beer. Um, and uh, uh, it's nothing, nothing that we can actually prove. But we've tasted it in these little breweries in Bavaria that still use still use cool ships um, uh, for it to to make lager beer. It's, there, there's something there, something extra there. Um, and that's the really that's the only the only way we can describe it. Um, but here at Dovetail, we don't just do um, we don't just do uh, uh, lager beers. Um, we, we also, uh, you know, when, when we describe ourselves, we say continental European style beers, traditional methods. Um, so um, uh, that means German, Czech, Belgian, and other. And the only Belgian beer, Belgian style beer I've mentioned is Epsom one so far. But we, we have a whole spontaneous fermentation program uh, uh, here. And, and uh, so we make beers that are uh, uh, fermented by the wild yeasts that we have all around us here in Chicago, the city of Garden, Herbs and Monto. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, we, we do that by, we only do this, this kind of brewing in spring and fall, but we do it by by making words in the brew house in a manner very different from what we described for a lager. Uh, we pump over into the cool ship, and for a lager beers, the, the, those, those beers, those, those words stay in here for an hour, hour and a half. Um, uh, the, uh, the spontaneously fermented beers stay in here overnight uh, with the windows open, uh, and uh, we let whatever uh, the brown line brings us the the outer the outer runs right outside right outside the windows here. Um, we let we let that those microbes get into the uh, into the wort here, and then we pump all that wort out directly into uh, into barrels uh, right right outside of here. Uh, are there any questions about about the culture? All right, we're going to go into our barrel house. Okay. If there's if there are questions, just just let us know. Yeah, little topper. So, unfortunately, our uh, barrel guy uh, Kevin. Shout out to Kevin Sager. Uh, he's not here today. We're hey, here to uh, talk about these beers. He's, uh, he's the guy we put in charge of uh, doing all the work up here. Um, and he spends a great amount of time and a lot of passion. So, yeah, thank you, Kevin Sager. Cheers. Cheers to Kevin. Shane. A couple questions just came through. Uh, Nicholas wants to know where do you drain out the cool ship? Misha wants to know aren't cool ships usually made of copper or something? 
Um, cool ships in the old days were made of copper. Um, uh, uh, Dovetail, uh, unfortunately, is not built on a mountain of money. Um, so uh, we couldn't do a copper cool ship. Um, but uh, the, 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 we, we priced one out. It was about twice as much as the one we have now. Was it only twice? I think it was three. three. I think it was two to three. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that, yeah. At that time, copper was expensive. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot of a lot of copper being used in like power generation plants. It's all around there. Um, uh, and then uh, the cool the, the cool ship drains out uh, through the far corner. It was behind us. It was a far corner, and it goes right into our fermentation uh, cellar. So we're going to stop there in uh, in a few minutes um, and, and show you show you where it where it goes. Um, but on the days that we do spontaneous fermentation, we actually disconnect the drain uh, and we pump right into right into uh, the barrels that you see that you see behind us. Um, so we've got we've got different kinds of barrels. The ones right behind us here and on the far wall there, those are ex bourbon barrels. They're actually ex bourbon barrel beer barrels. Um, a lot of them came from Revolution. Some of them came from or our neighbors Beguile and our, and our other neighbors um, Koval, uh, Koval Distilling. Um, uh, they're, they, like I said, they're neutral, so they they, they don't really have that, that bourbon character anymore. Although we are uh, we're doing limited experiments on, on fresh fresh dump uh, fresh dump barrels now, but for the for, for the barrels that do the do the initial fermentation. We're using, we're using fresh barrels. So we, we pump over right into these barrels, uh, and anywhere from two days to two weeks later, you get fermentation activity. What you, what you see is you see the uh, you see the barrels start to bubble over. So I don't know if you can let's let's see if you can see this this here. There's a little there's a little bit of residue from right, right around the right around the bung there from where it uh, from where it uh, uh, bu bubbled over. Um, so, uh, uh, the, and the, the barrel that I just showed you, that was a, that's an X wine barrel. It's a neutral wine barrel it's used for, for red wine for 10 years. Um, we, we at, at, at some point, we switched over, like in our second year, we switched over to um, uh, to, to wine barrels from bourbon barrels, because wine barrels are much better made than bourbon barrels. Uh, so we were we were doing a lot of work uh, to uh, to uh, kind of plug up leaks on, on our on bourbon barrels, and it just wasn't wasn't worth it wasn't worth it anymore uh, to do that. Both both uh, types of barrels produce uh, produce good beer. We needed the, to, to save labor. Here's the owl. I don't know if you guys can hear it. We're, we're here at the brewery. For anybody, for anybody that ha uh, that hasn't been here, uh, we're sandwiched between uh, the L over there and the Metro on on that side. Um, so we, it's uh, it's got its pluses and minuses. Sometimes it's hard to hear each other talk. We get, a, we get some nice vibration for these for these barrels over there. Um, so so the so beer comes in here and it sits anywhere from six months to uh, to a year to two years to three years and now we've got some four year uh, four year barrels too that we're that we're using in, in blends. And what we what we do with this uh, with this beer is um, there's a, a good portion of it that we choose. And we, we put it on top of fresh fruit uh, that we get uh, from uh, from Michigan mostly. And last year we got our our, our raspberries from uh, from Wisconsin. Uh, uh, we'll we'll select barrels, we'll put it on top of fruit, and re-ferment uh, for uh, you know, six to six to ten months, uh, and uh, and then bottle that. So. This year is really exciting because we've got uh, ten different kinds of fruit that we are uh, uh, that we we have re-fermented upon, and uh, uh, we'll be releasing those 
during or as the, as the uh, s season progresses, as the summer progresses. Um, and we've got uh, we've got our two of our first releases here, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna we're gonna taste these. Unfortunately, they're not in the pack, but maybe maybe some of you bought them. So we have uh, Fraise and Cassis. So Fraise is uh, strawberry. Cassis is. Uh, is black currant. Um, what, and, and which farm did we get these get, get these fruits from? Uh, strawberry was a uh, Hoffer Farm Market uh, up in uh, up around uh, outside of Holland, Michigan. The black currants, forget what farm that was. That was a little farther north, central Michigan. Uh, black currants are hard to find. Are the only. Uh, Grower that uh, we can find some black currants. You need a special permit from the uh, state Department of Agriculture uh, because they, if, if left unattended, they'll invade their invasive species. Uh, they're not good for uh, good for the land. Yes. Shane. Yeah. Eric wants to know: uh, Do all the wild beers have the same grain recipe? They do. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, <laughs> most they mostly do. Sixty percent Pilsner malt, forty percent raw wheat, uh, and traditional uh, Belgian style turbid mash. And what was your exception, Bill? Oh, our uh, twelve twenty-five XO series. Excellent. XO XO. So it's semi is semi spontaneous, but so our, our Christmas lamp. Yep, the the uh, 12, 12, 25, 16 was um, dark and aromatic malts. So here we've got uh, we've got flakes, the strawberry, and the, these these strawberries. Like some of the most delicious strawberries I've ever had. Uh, you guys, the guys, people behind the camera, do you agree? Yeah. That, that these strawberries were some of the most delicious strawberries. Oh, absolutely. These were great. They were crazy. There wasn't good. a bad one. <laughs> no, every like like we were. I don't I don't think I've had strawberries since last summer since these came in because. We, everybody at the brewery like gorged themselves on strawberries, and and uh, they were just like they were just like they're perfectly they're perfectly ripe and super flavorful. And what, what I like about this beer is that that, that the aroma of the strawberries is just it's there it's in, it's in there. It's got kind of that it's a strawberry ish color to it. So these are, for anybody that hasn't had these beers, these are sour beers. Um, we used six month old uh, uh, spontaneously fermented beer um, for these. What I like is you can also taste the seeds in this beer. Just, just the little strawberry seeds. In there's a question. Somebody named Shana has asked like a hundred questions. Uh, oh, one of Sh them, Shana. <laughs> one of them, uh, does thunder affect the barrels or weather or temperature fluctuations in general? Greatly. Greatly. Temperature fluctuations, uh, um, we believe vibration affects the barrels. Um, so, so, so the, um, uh, warmer weather tends to warm up the barrel house and, uh, sometimes these these barrels then wake up and they, they start to ferment again. Colder temperatures up here in the barrel house uh, uh, really uh, increase the clarity of the beer. They, uh, all the solids that might be suspended in the beer get uh, you know, fall fall to the bottom. Um, so you end up getting some nice nice clear beers. Yeah, and then and then uh, we, we believe that vibration 
allows the microbes to kind of percolate up, up through the beer. Thanks for that question, Shane. Um, should we try the cassis? Oh, I have to finish these. Oh, we got these. Mm. I'll finish this. That's fine. Sure. Finish it. So you so so usually these are not these are sipping beers. Oh yeah, that's good. So I have some stuff. Uh, how many barrels do we have? We have about seven hundred fifty barrels. Look at that color. Whoa! Look at that. So there's the there's the black currant or cassis. This one I'm really excited about. The uh, cassis, it's a traditional fruit uh, in uh, Belgian beer of the style. It's, uh, not, not too many people uh, like or enjoy the flavor of it. It's, uh, some people might say it has an aroma of uh, cat piss uh, or medicinal, like a medicine cabinet. But uh, well, those are like, those, really those things, it doesn't have that at all. Those things intrigue me. I mean, I wouldn't describe it. I don't, I'm, not, I'm just saying that's how it's That's, what, that's what, like, the negative, the, the yeah. naysayers describe that. This is like, it's just wonderful so indulgence. Like, it's like herbal flavor. Indulgent, I would say. Plus, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous color. Pink foams. It's got like, a, it's got a nice, um, like bitterness to it that comes from the, the cassis itself. That's fantastic. But this would be this would be uh, a nice beer to drink before a drink, I think, to to really like kind of get your Get your appetite going. Got another really great question. Yeah. Uh, Brad wants to know if you get to know the barrels and how do you do that, and if you have any favorites. Well, it's it, it's uh, really it's really a horrible a horrible kind of way that you get to know the barrels. You have to taste them. Um, and and there are definitely there are definitely magic barrels that we that we have that. There's one barrel way back there. You see the barrels on the wall? You, there's a barrel way back there that is like a magic barrel that we've used like three, four times. I think we're on, our, on the fourth use of that barrel already. Don't know what it is about that barrel, but it is it produces really, really good beer. Um, we used it in our original creek, the 2018. Some of which is still available. We used it in the uh, a beer that we called the T beers for. Uh, it was a, it's a blend that we made for Hop Leaf and uh, Hop Leaf Kaiser Tiger and Khaki Poppins. Then we, uh, we used it again in the first beer. So, so that is that's an amazing it's an amazing barrel. There, so so yeah so we're, it, it is one of the things that we're finding. Yeah, that, that there are there are magic barrels. And I, I mean, I really I uh, I think I, I think we think that. Uh, oh yeah, there's shame of being all right there. Unfortunately, not a magic bird. <laughs> but Shana, Shana is magic. Shana is magic. Just not her barrel. Yeah. Um. So, uh, 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 but but I, but this really this this whole we feel that this whole process of, of making these spontaneous beers is kind of magic. That you know we can we can brew this wort. We brew it in this you know like we brew it in this special way that we. 
we hope it attracts the right the, the right uh, microbes that are kind of setting a trap for them. Um, uh, and and you know we're really happy with the beers that are coming out of uh, of these barrels. So so we uh, it's it's really it's really kind of the two sides to this brewery. Like you know the, the, the side downstairs is like the beer, those beers we make are very controlled. Like we know what we're we know what we're putting in. We know what we're getting out. Uh, and these beers like we have we don't know we don't, you know we kind of it's a leap of faith on our part. Uh, to to say all right we we believe we believe that the city of Chicago has the right microbes uh, to to produce beers that will taste will taste good. Um, uh, it's it's really like a just a, a long term long term labor of love uh, for us. Yeah, it's, it's working out. So those beers are available right now. Um, if you want them, uh, get to the brewery because they're not. There's not much available. You can order them on our online store uh, for for pickup or delivery. If you're if you're within oh, like a about a one mile radius of the of the brewery, um, and if you. Uh, uh, just watch our our Twitchstagram or whatever whatever it's called um, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> uh, uh, see to see what, what we do different on Tuesdays and Wednesdays we do different drop zones of like uh, different neighborhoods uh, and and what, about every second Friday you can vote on, on the neighborhood that you want to uh, have your uh, details delivered to. Sure. Eric wants to know, is More Creek 2019 and Framboise coming out? Eric wants to know, is More Creek 2019 and Framboise coming out? No, not really. Creek 2019 is very, very, very limited. Framboise 2019 is basically done. But 2020 is coming. Creek 2020, Framboise 2020 is coming. So watch the Institute. What about your friends? The, uh, uh, the fruits. What other fruits? Oh my goodness! A plethora of fruits. Let's see, we got uh, plum, Italian plum, apple, blueberry, peach, peach, uh, grape, a uh, cabernet franc, cabernet franc, uh, black raspberry, raspberry, framboise noir, uh, and cherry, and uh, what else is there? Oh, Kevin can kill us. Something in a little, something in a small barrel. What else we do with small barrels? There's a whiskey Whoop. barrel? Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll think of it. But we're, we just did some whiskey barrel stuff in tequila. So there's going to be the phrase in tequila barrel. There's going to be uh, raspberry. And a rum barrel. And a rum barrel. Uh, there's going to be apple in a rum barrel. Uh, and. That was uh, was it was Creek in the uh, bourbon barrel. Yeah, and we and we just got a few more bourbon barrels, so we're going to see what kind of fun stuff we can, uh, we can do with that. And then the the, the uh, unblended, we've got a four year blend of uh, what we call vignette uh, coming out uh, soon too. So I think we're gonna we're gonna move to the next station. Uh, Going to leave the barrel house. Uh, Shane's got a question for us. Maybe we'll answer the question. Yeah, we move. While we're walking, uh, earlier on, Chris asked, uh, Where in Germany do you recommend visiting for beer drinkers? And Maggie asked, What's your favorite beer brewed in Germany? Ooh, those oh are big, gosh. tough questions. Yeah, that's why I saved them for now. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay, so, so De um, definitely got to go to uh, Bomberg in, uh, um, in Germany. Bomberg is a must. So, uh, so, so Munich is, is a great beer town, but I think our favorite, our favorite, oh Schneider, yeah. Uh, if, if you want to, if you want to visit Schneiderweiss itself, you have to go to, I think it's Lanzhou. To, I can't remember where. I can't remember where actually, no, it's not. I can't remember where, what town Schneider's in. Um, uh, uh, the the. Uh, 
It's called Kloster Veltenberg. Uh, it is a monastery. It's been brewing for 10 years less than uh, than Vine Stefan. So, so, they, so they only started brewing 1050. Uh, best, best, best Dunkel Lager that we have ever tasted. Um, uh, Cologne, or Cologne and, and Dusseldorf are, are must visits. Hey there, Sam. Hey, Sam. He's, Sam running, Sam. he's running away. He's running away, Sam. Sam Ireland, production manager, does so great. Um, uh, I mean, there's Leipzig too, right? Like, if you guys like, if you guys like Goza and you, and you want, uh, you want to, have a like, truly authentic Goza. Uh, I would I'd say Leipzig. Uh, if you want, uh, I, I, you can't. The funny thing about a, a beer like Berliner Weisse, you can't get much Berliner Weisse in Berlin these days anymore. But there is a uh, uh, a growing craft scene in Berlin, and supposedly there are there are some really nice. Small, smaller breweries that are uh, uh, brewing Berliner Weisse. I think JP might know the name of some of them. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? The Berliner Weisse? Yeah. In Berlin? Yeah. What, it's the German word for what is it? White Owl? Yeah, the Owl. The Owl one. The yeah, one. The, the, oh, the, the White Owl. Lady. She's yeah, like an eighty-year-old lady or something. No, like she's no, she's sixty. No, she's like maybe thirty. She's not yeah. old. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> I was thinking of someone else. Yeah, that's the Lithuanian, the godmother of Lithuania. Ah. There. Ah. Oh my goodness! Look, we just poured ourselves a uh, dovetail Um So, uh, and we happen to be in our fermentation cellar in front of our Hefeweizen tank. Yep. Should we stick close, or should, should we should we show the top of this tank? Oh yeah! Oh, that's nice. It's yeah. gorge. Look at that. Nice better than shine. better than the top nice of my shine, head. Shine off your eight head. Look at that. I bet, I've, I've I bet you got a nice one too. Look at I've that. Got, I've got like a good a good six head at least. So so um, more advanced. Uh, so so uh, Bill actually had long flowing hair when we started this whole thing. Like, like, like Fabio. Fabio. Yeah. Yep. No, okay, man. Yeah. So it's all fell in my face. So if you like your hair, don't start a group. Um, <laughs> Shane. Sheena is asking, I know this is the third type of glassware used today. Why oh. use different types of glassware? Man, this is this, such a, that's such this a person. Is this. Shana is good. Intuitive um, question. So, so this, we're, we're, our, our Hefeweizen is served in a, in a tip, traditional Hefeweizen glass. So, uh, so, and, and let's get at that question from the perspective of Hefeweizen. So, thin at the bottom, wide at the top. Hefeweizen is a uh, is a highly effervescent beer, and when you pour it, it produces more foam. So the so the wide top is designed to catch that foam and to help you manage the the pouring of the beer. Um, so so uh, so so. Pouring and presentation is part of it. Um, for us, when we design our hate you know, we, we talked about the, um, all, all the senses and the, and the Damn, visual. So you can you can see like what a lot of what we're about when we design a beer is uh, is balance. Uh, so so uh, the typical hate has um, has elements of clove and banana. We in this Hefeweizen, we want we want uh, clove and banana to be in balance, and, and we, we directly import our bananas from South America. <laughs> there are no a, no actual bananas. No bananas are hard when you're making this beer. Yeah. So 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 we also wanted the color to kind of get at a balance in this beer. So through, so through the the thick part of this beer, you see like a nice orange color, and through the thin part of this or of this glass. And in the thin part of the glass, you see this this Ooh, kind of yellowish gorgeous. color. So 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 when we you know you come into the tap room and we serve you we serve you a dovetail hefeweizen, we want we want that that idea of balance to be playing 
uh, on your on your mind as you as you get that beer, and then bring it to your nose. Yeah, there's definitely clove. There's definitely banana. We banana throw these clothes. So we throw uh, we we don't throw cloves into the brew house. The, throw them in the fermenter. We throw them in the fermenter. Right? No, <laughs> we don't throw no. There are no cloves. There are no bananas in this beer at all. It's it's um, it, we it, this all comes from the yeast. Uh, and we, what we do is our, our brew for, for brew day for this beer, our mash uh, uh, regimen for this beer is different than it is for our, our lagers. We, we, we brew it uh, at, at different temperatures so that we bring out the possibility of the, of the yeast changing the elements of the wort into clove. Uh, and then we ferment it in, in these fermenters um, uh, uh, to to accentuate the the banana component of of these beers. But well, let's take a taste. Well, I, I've been drinking all the whole time. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Once again, lacing very important to us. Yeah, this one tastes like juicy fruit. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so what you see behind us um, is uh, is a fermenter that has no top on. So, that, so what we do here at Dovetail for all of our like normal beers, our mainstay beers, is we uh, we do open fermentation. This is another very traditional method. Um, and actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna sh show you guys something here. Um, so, oh my goodness! Oh, uh, what am I doing? What am I doing? Where, where do you want to go? I want to go to the uh, to the pipe. Oh, geez. Well, here we are. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. So, so here, here. Check this out. There's this pipe here. And it runs to the ceiling. It trust me. It runs to the ceiling. And it runs through a hole in the ceiling that is has falling plaster around it because uh, um, uh, sometimes sometimes things leak upstairs, um, and and that runs to the cool ship. So we're we're right under the cool ship right now. So so up there, about an hour after we're done with the brew. Um, our, our, our uh, wort has cooled in the cool ship and it comes down here all through gravity and it goes through through this thing, this device, that's called a heat exchanger and, and it gets cooled down to fermentation temperatures, uh, which in the case of lager is very cold and you know, just kind of just above freezing. Um, and in the case of ales like like this Hefeweizen is uh, like root, like a, a, a nice room temperature. Um, and it, so it flows by gravity. We connect up these hoses and it goes right into these, uh, these, these open fermenters where and that's where we add the yeast. So, so this, in, in contrast to what we just talked about upstairs, the spontaneous fermentation, we, we get yeast from a lab. We, we add it to our beer. Um, down here, and we know what we're putting in, we know what we're getting out. Um, and you know, hopefully the hundredth batch of, uh, of Hefeweizen is, is, like, is just like the first batch of Hefeweizen. Um, so, so for the, the Hefeweizen, the yeast that we use for this is different than the lager yeast. Uh, the, the lager yeast uh, lagers uh, to us are, are about kind of about malty, the interplay between malt and hops. But um, ales are more about the interplay between malt, hops, and either fruitiness or floral, floral kind of um, elements to it. And, and the fruity, the fruity floral elements usually come from, but mostly come from the. Uh, the higher fermentation temperatures and the uh, uh, and the yeast that is uh, that is used. So so this yeast, the hefeweizen yeast, 
is known for producing um, producing clove and banana flavor and aromas. And it's also known for being very, um, very stress intolerant. So in other words, this is kind of a, this beer is kind of a diva of all, uh, of all yeast. So um, under a little bit of stress, this, this yeast just like gives up. It, it doesn't produce those flavors. It doesn't, it, so it might, it might uh, uh, not produce uh, 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 alcohol at all. Uh, it might just completely stop working. And one of the biggest stressors on yeast is uh, pressure. So, so yeast takes sugar and creates alcohol and CO2. Um, and if you have a top on these fermenters, that pressure is gonna build up um, and uh, you know, in a lot of a lot of other breweries, like that, that have tops on their fermenters, you'll see like a bucket kind of next to the fermenter, and it's bubbling, and that's how you know that fermentation is going on. The reason it's bubbling is that pressure is built up. Uh, and in the case of in the case of hefeweizen in particular, any little bit of pressure increase above the hefeweizen is going to push down on the beer. It's going to create more pressure on the yeast, and it's not going to be able to push out the CO2 and the alcohol as easily. So that's, and that's stress. And, and yeast does not like stress. It works best without stress. And that, that's kind of like what we, what we always say about yeast uh, here at Dovetail is that yeast are like people. Uh, they like sugar, they like to reproduce, and they don't like stress. So, so that's the reason we chose to do all of our beers. Uh, in a low stress kind of environment with, with open, open fermentation. Um, any questions out there? No, I hear, well, actually, here, oh, I guess some questions. These are the fermenters that Hagen spoke of earlier uh, that were purchased from uh, Orbert's son of Lothar. Uh, these came out of the oldest family owned brewery in Germany. This brewery started in 1328, so 300 years younger, old, younger than uh, Vine Stefan. And this was, uh, what was the name of this brewery? Schloss Brauerei Herrn Gierstorf. Yeah, Pauli Paulson was the guy we bought these from. Uh, great guy. He was, uh, I think, a German, um, you know, Heavyweight uh, lifter or something like that, because he was he, he would move one of these things by himself across the room. It's a magical day. We'll yeah, we, we actually we, so so we saved some money on uh, on take. So we took these things out of the third floor of a brewery of that brewery, and uh, we saved some money by going over and being a labor. Which you know, if you look, take a look at us, like these two guys show up. How much, how much help are we? Um, well, but, the best part right. of that day is when you start out with a case of beer each right. at 7.30 so, in the morning. Right, so Paul, so, so Paul, he, like, Paul he, like, brought us, he's like, oh, wait, first things first. And then he goes and like, brings us a case, a case of beer here yeah, for your day, for your working. And, and uh, um, yeah, so, yeah. So, so we put in the work and, and like, went down like, a little fast. Yeah, like, like, so, so we, we blew a, a hole in the wall of this old brewery. And and there was, we we had we had rented a crane um, to to pull these things out. And like me and Bill are like we're like trying to trying to move one of these things, push them across the floor to the opening in the wall that is like like this much bigger than the than the fermenter. And 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 Polly Polly walks in and he's like, "Come on, let's go!" And he like pulls up his pants like, "Damn!" And he starts. He he starts pushing the pushing the fermenter to the opening in the wall, and yeah, yeah, that guy was funny. He, uh, he was like the mayor of town. He wasn't the mayor. Well, they had this road construction happening in front of the brewery, which is hindering us uh, doing this, and so he stopped that, put that on hold. So he was the he was done. the influencer. He told me he he was like much better to be an influence than to be the mayor. 
<laughs> yeah. I remember this, this town was the size of like, have you ever been to Dovetail Brewery? It'd been like from here to Beguile. The size of this town. <laughs> yeah. True. True. Shane, question. Yeah. Caroline is asking, how do the beers not get contaminated in open fermenters? Oh, such a good question. Caroline, thank you. Such a good question. So, so, so here the the beauty uh, the the beauty of of yeast is that uh, and here here's one one thing to realize is that human beings have a nine or ten thousand year relationship with with yeast. All right. So I don't know if we selected yeast or if yeast selected us or yeast or, did not select or, us. or some somewhere in between. But uh, but but uh, we uh, we get from yeast this 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 drink or these these various drinks that we like, and yeast gets from us the uh, the ability to to reproduce and mutate and can, and, and and multiply. Um, so one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons that uh, that we are in this relationship with yeast. Is that yeast protects its own source of food, uh, and one of the ways that it does that is by producing CO two. Uh, so, so carbon dioxide is heavier than air. Um, so, uh, when as as the beer is uh, fermenting in in this fermenter, there's a nice blanket of CO two up above the uh, the beer. It just sits there, um, and it kind of as as more CO two is produced, it kind of spills out over the uh, over the sides of the fermenter, um, and and what that does is it keeps um, you know it keeps a clean environment above the above the beer. So um, uh, uh, when uh, let, let's say like a fruit fly. A fruit fly carries carries spoilage organisms with it, and when it uh, if it tries to fly into one of these fermenters to, to go eat eat some sugar, it's going to encounter uh, uh, an environment that it can't breathe in. So it's going to immediately go the other way, and in fact, it's going to be helped to go the other way by the the currents, the CO two currents that are that are flowing out of out of the fermenter, um, and then the other reason it doesn't get uh, it, it doesn't get contaminated by anything else is that we have to transfer the beer from these fermenters to lagering tanks uh, in the other part of the brewery before it's done fermenting. It's about two thirds done fermenting. When we transfer it out here, so it's an extra step for us, but we feel that it's worth it because of the low stress uh, that the yeast is under. Another question. Yes, uh, Carrie wants to know how did you get all the equipment back here. Carrie, Carrie wants to know how we got all the equipment back here. Well, uh, we uh, it, it came over in uh, our luggage. Uh, yeah. It did not. The, the, the overhead compartments on the plane. The stewards and stewardesses were not happy with us that flight back, but so, we got it. So it, it, so it came it came over in containers, you know, those shipping containers. That you see. So we had a couple of shipping containers, um, and then um, we brought it into the building. Okay, oh God, let's road. see let's see if this works. So so that kind of corner of the building. Probably really hard to see, but that corner of the building used to be an entrance, uh, and we we tore it out, uh, and it, we made it we made a hole in there just big enough to bring everything uh, everything in through that through that hole. Uh, it was it was quite an operation. I think we're going to go so so we're going to go to the next part of uh, the last part of our. Our tour. Uh, really good question. We're going to touch on that coming up. So, um, 
different years and take different amounts of time. Hello? 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 Sorry, Sam. Temporary. All right, so we're, we're, we're back upstairs here. Um, we're standing in front of Lager Tank, so um, uh, this is this is really the, the final spot that, that our beer comes to uh, to mature. Um, so uh, yellow tanks behind us, the, uh, the stainless steel tanks, our new ones. White, you know, those, are, those, those those tanks way in the back. Um, so these are called lager tanks. Uh, by the way, lager is a German word that means to uh, cellar or, or, to, uh, or store, or to store or storage. Um, uh, in the in the old days, um, uh, most breweries would have had a, a lager. In, most breweries in Germany would have had a, a, a lager underneath uh, underneath their brewery, meaning a, a, a cave. Uh, where they had uh, big wooden uh, wooden barrels that uh, aged the beer um, anywhere from uh, a month to, to to six months. In the, in the old days, you, because of temperatures, you know, they used to be able to uh, to brew from September, end of September to uh, to the very beginning, very beginning of April, um, uh, because the summer was too uh, uh, was, was too warm to properly cool the beer, so the, so uh, the, the beers of old would get infected beers, uh, sour kind of sour tasting beers. Um, uh, so we ran out of money before we could dig our cave. So instead, we have these the uh, these tanks behind us. Uh, these are what we call our lager tanks. So uh, they're all cooled, uh, they have cooling jackets around them that are filled with, uh, with glycol. Uh, when, the, when the beer is ready to be transferred up to these lager tanks, um, uh, we, um, uh, we, we, we transfer it and we go through a process of, of storing the beer at uh, uh, at the same temperature where we have them downstairs, and then we and then we slowly bring the temperature down. In the case of lager beers, uh, very close to uh, very close to freezing. Uh, so uh, the lager that we had at the, at the beginning, um, from the day that we brew it, I'm pointing at our brew house, and it's right on the other side of where we're where we're standing now. Um, so the day that, from the day that we brew it to the day that it's ready to serve is five weeks. Uh, same for the for the Ralph beer, uh, for the Hefeweizen, uh, it's three weeks. Um, the Vienna is also a five week beer. A uh, Pilsner, if you've had it, uh, is an eight week beer. Um, our Bach beers, though. Bach beers are take many many months to make. So, uh, so if you've ever been to our our, our May May Fest or our um, our October Fest, uh, you know that we have a special beer for that day. And now we're going to crack our we're going to crack our fourth beer on my Bach. So my Bach. Our Maybach is a is a strong version of our Hellas. Uh, it's a lager. Uh, it's brewed in January, and it was brewed for today. Um, our birthday. Our birthday, and our May, and, and uh, ours in, in the Giles Mayfest. And uh, uh, usually, usually we'd have usually we'd have a lot of you guys here. Um, uh, celebrating with us, we're really sad that we can't uh, can't be celebrating now, but we're really happy to have you guys here. So we're celebrating virtually. So Shana had a wonderful question earlier of how do we know how each beer 
along each bear stays in our yellow tanks. Uh, and I believe Hagen touched briefly on that. And it's just about the style of beer, uh, what we are making. Um, and we're also waiting just for the, you know, the balance and the harmony of the beer to come together. So we do, we do tasting along the way. It's a hard job. Lots of tasting really of beer. Tough. Anyway, so if you guys, hopefully you guys have poured a, uh, poured a Maybach. There's that, there's that nice stand of foam again above the, oh, above the rim of the glass. Oh, my God. Oh, jeez. Oh, my God. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, guys. Happy birthday, fans of Dovetail. Customers loyal. Thank you, guys. Far. Thank you guys so much uh, for, for joining us. It, actually, one of the things you see in the background here is our candy lock too, that we added last April. And, uh, we, really, um, we really appreciate that you guys have been uh, coming, out, coming out to the brewery uh, to buy beer directly. We really appreciate that you've been buying beer um, at all of our um, all of our off-premise accounts. Uh, we would not be here without you guys. Um, so thank you. Cheers, thank you so much for that. Get time for a few more questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course. Well, uh, Carrie just asked something kind of touching on that. Aside from ordering for curbside pickup, how can we support Dovetail during this crazy time? You can um, you can buy our beer anywhere anywhere Any that you find it. Honestly. All the um, all the uh, neighborhood liquor stores. Yep. And if they don't have it, ask, ask them. them. Yes. Ask them to ask. It's them. a re it's a really good point. If, if 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 you go into a liquor store that doesn't have dovetail, ask for it. It makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. Um, I mean, but obviously the best way you can support us is by coming coming here to to buy, directly. to buy the beer directly because we. Uh, we definitely appreciate uh, appreciate the support, and Another, you can you can get a better variety here. Uh, is that they're basically we so we've got what we call the uh, you know the core. Really, it's the core three out in out in the market right now. The uh, the house, the the uh, Vienna, and the Hefeweizen. Um, Pretty soon it'll be the core four because we we're, we're going to be adding Kirsch uh, to it. Um, but if you if you come here, you can get our lager too, uh, which is our house the, you know, the house lager that we started with today. Uh, and you can get any any one offs that we produce. So what what we're trying to do um, is uh, we're, we're, we're producing uh, producing one offs consistently, especially during this time. Uh, another way to uh, support the Dovetail family is the uh, Stomtisch on the uh, website. All that money goes directly to all our employees uh, that have been furloughed during this uh, pandemic. Hopefully we'll get them uh, back here as soon as we can. Get them serving beers to you guys soon. Let's, uh, let's knock out a few questions really fast. We've got a bunch of variations on the same question. Uh, what's a beer that you want to brew but haven't tried to brew yet? Uh, people asked about Zwickel, Zoigel, and Rogan beer specifically. Oh, the Rogan oh, nice. beer. That is one beer I would like to brew. 100% rye beer. Uh, sounds like a brewer's nightmare, but I think, it, uh, I think we can pull it off. We're 100% we're for the brewer's nightmare. Um, <laughs> Everybody knows that. Uh, Ro Rogan beer would be one. Well, beyond Rogan beer, huh? what would you want? To, what would be your top yeah. beer you'd want to make? So, 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 you know, uh, oh, wow, the hat. We've got the uh, we've got the Huffman Vice on the calendar right now. We do. And that's that's one that's been. Uh, we'd like to we'd like to do more exploration around the Hefeweizen because there's a. You know, there's a huge world of hafenites that needs to be needs to be explored. Um, we don't, we'd also like to bring back 
I don't, if anybody that's been drinking up here for a long time, um, we had it for a long, for right at the beginning we had the Hopfen Lager, and we would like to bring the Hopfen Lager uh, back too. But I know that this gentleman next to me has a recipe somewhere either in his head or in his beard for a, a true Leipziger Goza that we need to that we need to do. Which is then again on the uh, world of Hefeweizen, right? Because Goza is a wheat beer, soured, salted, coriander. It's gonna be fantastic. Here's another one from Daniel uh, about tomorrow morning. He has no vice versa. Sorry, he has vice versa, but no Hefeweizen. She have the Pilsner or the Maybach. What's he asking about there? Oh my gosh, Daniel, with your vice versa. <laughs> because it is our birthday weekend, you must be drinking the Maybach. Yeah. It's the best beer in the morning to drink. In fact, start your day off right. If you all would like to join us tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. <laughs> for a beer in the morning with sausage. Hagen and I will be we're resuming. Uh, it's going to be on the YouTube page. YouTube, we're, we're YouTubing. We're YouTubing in our lighter hosen. We will break out our birthday best yeah. and uh, drink Let's beer with you in the soon. morning as we do every Sunday morning on our birthday weekend. Where'd the name Dovetail come from? So, so the Dovetail Joint, uh, strongest joint in woodworking, best Dovetail Joints hold with without doing else, so, so we see this, this brewery is two brewers coming together to form a stronger brewery. All right, parting shot. Sorry. Oh, hey, look at that, birds. Oh my God. If you've ever been to the Dovetail Tap Room, you know that we like the baggings. All right, team. Come on, team behind the scenes, so get in here. Now make it. Come on out oh, here. come on, all the way in here. Come on, JP. There she is. Here we are, Bergings. Bergings. Happy Mayfest. Thanks for joining us.